This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. We have a service call on a beer walk-in today. Uh, looks like it's frozen up and the temps in here are about 50 degrees and it looks like we've got some uh, frost going on there too. So we're gonna dive into this and see what we can figure out. Looks like that panel had been left off too. So this coil, we found that the power switch, which is right over here, was off. We turned it on and the fans turned on and it's defrosting, but this is a freezer coil and it does have electric heat, so we are going to have to finish defrosting it. However, the other coil on the other side, the fans will not turn on, so we're going to have to dig into that one. And this is the far coil. Look at this. i got to figure this crap out. Look at all that burnt goodness there. Looks nice and toasty in here. So it looks like this was never hooked up correctly from in the first place because I'm um, following the schematic and like there's not even anything going to the neutral or the end terminal. I shouldn't call it neutral, the end terminal or the common terminal on the fan delay defrost termination switch. That's what this is. This is because it's a ceiling mounted coil and it has two coils, they use this style instead of the clicks on. So there's no uh yeah, it's just not hooked up right. Nothing's, it looks like this is a mess. And look at this big six gauge wire, it looks like. And like the fans are staged, like they just randomly just turned on right now too. So it also, from the looks of it, this isn't working right. This is a whole mess. So we'll have to clean this up, replace the switch. and see what happens. This is the other coil. This one's got some burnt wires, not as bad, but what are they doing with that six gauge wire going to a 12 gauge or 14? I don't know, I don't understand what's going on here. This is a mess. You see, we're gonna have to do a bunch of work here and get this cleaned up. So my control section on the roof, there's a lot of mess going on up in here too. This isn't what we're dealing with, but look at my, uh, Condenser fan motor contactors are disconnected, it looks like. Oh no, these are ice machine. Never mind. Yeah, but still, I, I, I hate when stuff's bypassed. These are bypassed, that contactor. Looks like maybe it was a bad contactor or something. I think they have separate condensers now, if I remember right. We'll see for their ice machine. So these may not even be in play anymore. But look at your condenser fan motor fuses are all bypassed. And then, uh, this is our time clock for that system. Nothing funky, I checked the voltages, it's correct. Everything looks good. There's a separate contactor for the heater circuit. Um, we're probably gonna throw this into defrost and defrost those coils up. Which I just did that right now. But see, here's the thing. That contactor shouldn't have pulled in yet because there should be an interlock on the compressor contactor. See, the compressor contactor still pulled in. It just pulled out, but the defrost heater contactor pulled in before that one pulled out. Typically, you have an interlock here that stops that one from pulling in when the compressor's still running. So we'll have to figure that out too. Looks like we got a mess here. So, when we come out of uh, three, which is our defrost terminal, the power goes up on this black wire right here, and it wire nuts right here. To me, this looks like someone disconnected the auxiliary relay that should be on the side of that contactor. Because for there to be a junction point right here tells me that that auxiliary relay should have been right there. And, and I know that this rack originally came with that. Um, so that auxiliary relay needs to be put back in there. So that way there's no possibility that the heaters run when the compressor is still running. Um, so that's one thing, but I'm just kind of evaluate everything before I jump into this because this is kind of a mess. I'm trying to make sense of what's going on here downstairs with the wiring and, and everything. I understand the difficulty here is that they have a separate power source for the defrost heaters, which is right here. And there's gonna be separate voltage for the defrost heaters right here 
So I gotta figure out what they're doing there because the wire size is changing, which is strange. So I'm still trying to make sense of it. So I've got the unit in defrost and the defrost heaters are actually taking care of the frost pretty well. Um, you can see the coil inside there. Looks like it's defrosting pretty good. My theory without, I'm still trying to make sense of what's going on here, but my theory is, is that this coil is getting too hot because defrost termination is not hooked up is my theory, but I don't know if that's the case yet. We'll see. You got defrost heaters right down there and the heat coming off of that's pretty intense and it's just coming up and melting this cover because they're being put in defrost too long, I bet. So we will see. So this thing's a mess and my my I'm trying to rationalize what they're doing here and make sense of it. I mean look at this. This is a, a heater wire and they're going from like six down to a 12 and that 12 is rigid because obviously it's running super high amps through that 12 gauge um, I think those heaters were pulling almost 20 amps that might not even be a 12 I bet you that's a 14 because it's got a thick jacket on it um, that's just like a cluster but honestly this is just a beer walking and they're only maintaining I mean they can't get any colder than 32 degrees in here because they've got bottles of beer so I'm gonna make this unit air defrost and we're gonna eliminate all this electric defrost BS because yeah the, no the set point on this box is 36 degrees so I, I just I don't understand why they have electric defrost here so we're gonna make this guy air defrost um, we're gonna and this is gonna solve our problems I just got to figure out the wiring it shouldn't be too difficult we'll disconnect that second contactor and go from there. So up on the roof, I disconnected the coil voltage to the heater contactors, and that was all running through here. And then I disconnected the number three wire, I disconnected the X terminal. Um, so now we're just gonna have one, which is power to the clock, and N, which is power to the clock. And then four and N are going downstairs on blue and black right here. And we're just gonna wire the fans constant down there and then we'll test everything and make sure it all works. Um, when I am done, I will write not in use on everything that's dead. And we'll go ahead and pull these wires that were going downstairs to the heaters and we'll cap them and put the cover, cause all the covers for the contactors are over there. We'll put the covers back on and write not in use on this one. Um, I'm gonna open this up. I bet you anything this contactor's hitted so we might be changing that, but we'll see. So this is where we're at so far. This is the two wires, so this is like a six gauge, or an eight gauge, and it's really rigid too. And this is like a 14 gauge. They were going from that to that, like, but from the 14 to the, uh, whatever. So we're just gonna clean this up and cap it off so nobody gets confused. This isn't gonna be too difficult at all. And from the looks of it, this thing was never really hooked up right anyways, because, yeah, it's just a mess. There was no fan delay in the picture for the, um, the fans originally, so. All right, so all the wires that aren't being used, I just capped them off. Now we literally, I left the heaters hooked up to their terminals just so that there isn't a bunch of dangling wires, but there's nothing going to them. We literally just have our fan motors here and uh, you got one leg here, jumping over to that, and then you got one leg here going to that. So the fans are running 24 seven. This thing has screws from the other side. I'm not gonna bother ripping the coil apart just to get it out, so. Uh, and on another note, if I wanted to change that, the capillary won't come out of there, so it's a mess, but this should work. Now we're gonna do the other coil. This is my other coil, and if you guys were paying attention to what I was doing on the first coil, you should have been screaming at me because I wasn't thinking straight. I was gonna power the fans off of blue and black. The problem is, is that um, one of those wires gets disconnected by the time clock so that way it can pump the system down when it goes into defrost So I can't power the fans that way So I do have an extra wire in here and that was a white wire coming down We're going to use that to power the fans so the, the fans will have two constant power sources and then the switched leg Will be the other one and that'll just be disconnecting the um, Solenoid valve so that way the system goes into pump down All right, so now I fixed it 
the white wire and the black wire are going to power for my fans. The blue wire gets capped off because that's power from the time clock that's going to go to the temp control and the solenoid valve. So that's just not being used there. So this should now work. So we're not going to put any covers on until we go upstairs and wire everything up there and then um, test it all. So if I wired this right, this should work right here. And we're going to test everything right now and we'll zip tie everything up to make it look clean. But um, yeah, we'll test it all and see. Hopefully everything works. Okay, so now it's all set up and we tested it. So we leave this one off, but it's not going to hurt if we turn it on because there's only power coming into the top of that contact or nothing coming out. Here's the old wires for the heaters. We're going to clean all that stuff up. We'll get kind of zip tie crazy up in here. Um, you can see obviously too, I'm not going to dig into this right now, but this X terminal is disconnected for their walk-in freezer. Um, anyways, we'll get to that later. This right here, I put in a new defrost clock too, because I figured I'm in here, might as well, um, with all the work that I'm doing. I want a better defrost strategy, uh, and I was just didn't want any problems. Now, this is a test. There's a possibility that we could still have defrosting problems, because you know, they're only maintaining like 35, 36 degrees inside that box because they store bottles of beer. And so we can't get below 32. Um, we may set it for 34 or something like that, but I think we'll still be okay, but we just gotta kind of watch it. I also have to remember that this evaporator coil is a freezer coil, so the fin spacing is different. Uh, so that can affect the defrosting too. So we have to make sure we have a proper air defrost strategy. This is gonna be a trial and error. We're gonna see how this works and what happens. Um, so we know that uh, right now I have someone downstairs The evaporator fan motors run while it's in defrost, but the system pumps down. It's pumped down at the moment I just took it out And we'll come over here It'll take a sec for the temperature controller because it's a digital there it goes We cut in about 36 psi this location actually is the one where I had the pressure control issue with the um, pressure regulating power head. And uh, it's funny too, because I cleaned the rack that day when I made that video and the rack's already plugged up again. It's crazy how fast this happens, but. Anyways. Um, flashing on our sight glass though, so that's not good. So we're gonna have to figure that out, but now that we've got the defrost strategy fixed, we can look into the sight glass and see what's up with that. I pulled the cover to that contactor and you could just tell there's some burning even before I pull those little poles, it's it's all charred in there. So we're gonna change that contactor too. New contactor's installed, it's working. I just kinda quickly tied up those wires. They're not going anywhere. Set up my defrost strategy. So what we did was we start out with four defrosts a day for 15 minutes evenly. So eight, eight, two, and two. I threw an extra one at midnight and then I threw an hour long defrost in the middle of the night. We're gonna start with this strategy and see if we have to improvise or adjust it accordingly. Important thing, I like to put a long defrost in the middle of the night, but this particular restaurant, one day a week, they get here at like uh, four in the morning. You wanna make sure that defrost strategy isn't defrosting like that at four in the morning or they'll call you at four in the morning to say, hey, my walk-in's not working, you know? And it's like, in all reality, this hour-long defrost in the middle of the night with the door shut, isn't gonna bring their product temp above 41, but the air temp might get a little high inside there. But, you know, it's just one of those things, you don't want them to panic and call you at four in the morning. So you gotta think about that kind of stuff. Um, so at this point, I thought there was uh, low on charge, but it actually isn't. The sight glass cleared up. It was just taking a minute after the pump down. So the sight glass is clear back there. Um, okay, we're still gonna check superheat on the evaporator, um, just because I wanna know what the superheat is. Uh, it's currently about, yeah, 88 degrees is probably eh, 90. I'd say it's gonna get a little bit warmer, so. So we're just gonna watch it for a bit. So this is my first coil. My Super Heat's 43 degrees. It's about 43 degrees in the box. And my coil's got a funky frost pattern going on. And then if you come over here and look at my valve, my valve's all frosting up. I bet you anything we have a bad power head or a power head that's going bad. We're gonna look over my other coil. Kind of doing the same thing. Frosty valve, frosting up down the coil. We'll check the superheat on that one too. My second coil is running even higher on the superheat. And again, my box temp is 43 degrees. When you look at my coil TD, it's insanely high. So I'm leaning towards these power heads failing. 
if you look at them, they're all corroded. The paint's coming off. That, not that that matters, but yeah, we're gonna change those power heads. We'll check that strainer too to make sure it's clean. So I went to go pump this down and uh, it's pretty warm outside right now. It's about uh, just under 100 degrees. And when the head pressure got up to about 340 PSI, the scroll set inside the compressor disengaged and it started to bypass the high side pressure into the suction. Um, so I had to uh, turn off the breaker, let the pressures, uh, the, the, the little, what do they call it? A liquid, not a seal, it's whatever. It's, some little mechanism inside there it separated so i had to let that reset then i started it back up and it ran but when i started it back up i opened up the receiver so i was pumping it down when it when it you know disengaged or bypassed um so what i did i don't know if it's overcharged or if it's because it's a dirty condenser because the condenser is a little dirty so i hooked up this hose while it was pumping down and let it shoot some refrigerant into that recovery cylinder as a liquid so that way if it is overcharged which is my theory that it pumped that liquid refrigerant into there. So I'll test the charge once we uh, turn the system back on. Um, quite a bit went into that tank. So now we're gonna go downstairs and do a hot swap on these power heads because I didn't want to have to uh, change the dryer and vacuum the system down. So we just pumped it down to about just under 10 PSI and I'm gonna change those power heads under pressure. We're about 7.9 PSI. So we'll change those under pressure. So there was a tag that indicated the valve's build on the power head, so we're gonna make sure we put that on the new one. It says they put a B cartridge in this valve. So we're gonna change that power head under pressure, like I said. sense in saving the power head. Cut that off. And that way I can just do this real quick. Got my other one ready. Going with the medium temp. There was a low temp on there. No need for that. But watch out. These pins will shoot out. There is no pin the type of valve that it is. where it was, which is right here, we're gonna sense over to here, so. Yeah, so that one's swapped out, and then we'll get on the next one. I'm gonna make sure that the sensing bulb isn't anywhere where it's gonna rub out. It's got a nice clean line. I took it out of the coil, which was a really crappy location for it. Mounted it right out here, put it about two o'clock, and I sanded the line before 
I uh, put it down just to make sure I got a nice clean surface and then we'll go ahead and do the other one. When you clip these things if they're new, then you should have spray on spray. It's not good. Uh, it's okay, be very careful. I kind of bent the valve just a little bit out of the way so that way I can get up in here. It's okay. This one's gonna be a little tight because that strainer head is right in my way. I don't think the strainer is gonna be plugged up, but we will check that. More than likely, I think that our problem is the power head's just bad. Oh, this is a crappy angle. Try this. There we go. Use leverage, so use your hands. It's really bad on my wrist. Okay, twist it back down so it stops leaking for the moment. This one should have pins in it, unlike the other one. Watch out. Single pin. Threads on, you don't cross it. It should go on effortlessly. I can still hear it pissing out gas, so we're in a good, good place. Ignore. Okay. Now we just gotta wrench that power head on. A little bit of oil in there, that's okay. We can hurt nothing. Here. Probably not gonna be the greatest way to do this, but. You gotta do what you gotta do. still has pressure in it. So we're going to pull the strainer really quick. It should be really easy. Strainer's plug-o bug Looks like crap. So that strainer's done. Um, I'm gonna go to my van and get another strainer. Cause that one, it's not gonna do. I can't clean it under pressure. So I just need to have another one. So I just torqued it on real quick and I'll go get another strainer right now. My spoiling BQ kit. I usually keep strainers in here, but I'm all out, but I happen to have a valve that had that same style of strainer, so I pulled the strainer for now. But yeah, if you have your BQ kit, if you can, leave some space and keep some strainers in there. Um, that way, you know, if you're doing a hot swap like this and you don't have time to clean it, you can just pop a new strainer in there, but I'll pick up a new one next time I'm at the supply house. Hey, what do you know? We have suction pressure now. So what I did was, uh, this thing had low temp power heads with pressure limiting, uh, I said it had low temp expansion valves with pressure limiting power heads, or low temp power heads that had the pressure limiting feature on them. And I, I put in medium temp power heads because really this shouldn't have been low temp anyways. The coil temp on this doesn't get below 20 degrees. It should have never had low temp power heads on it to begin with. And then on top of that, the pressure limiting power head 
I get why they did that because it had electric defrost and because it's a higher temp box, it would be under a heavy load. But uh, anyways, I, I eliminated that from the picture. Now, remember I did let some refrigerant out. So we are gonna have to put the refrigerant back into the system because we are flashing on our sight glass. This system does have a head pressure control valve too. So we will make sure that we check the refrigerant level in the receiver to make sure that it has enough for the um, uh, headmaster head pressure control valve once we're done charging it. But looks like we're gonna be very happy now, so. Here's my strainer. It is plug-o bug-o, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. I think it's gonna be hard for you guys to see inside of it, but it's got chunks inside of it. It was doing its job. Someone before me, previous company before us, wasn't uh, using proper refrigeration practices for sure. So I gave the rack a quick rinse, nothing crazy, just real quick. We actually are flashing. Um, even after I put all that refrigerant back in, we were flashing. So I'm thinking maybe it was going off on bypass just because the rack was dirty. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the sight glass and then add the remaining refrigerant for the winter charge and then we're gonna finish diagnosing. It's like one thing after another here. So this thing keeps going off on bypass. It keeps uh, internally bypassing the high side will disengage and it equalizes out with the suction side. And this is an original 04 compressor. I think that the compressor was weak and I think everything that I've been doing today is just adding to the problem. I think they had a dirty condenser. This thing's been limping along. But because I took the pressure limiting power heads out, I think that the compressor was already going bad and the pressure limiting power heads is just sending it over the edge. Because now we've actually got suction pressure. Mind you, it's only 37 degrees in the box. So, you know, 36. It's it's not like we're we're going crazy with the expansion valves. I mean, that's just a little bit, that's like a 12 degree evaporator TD. So it's running like it should be. And it's hot outside, so it'd be expected that we have almost 400 head pressure right now. It's, uh yeah, it's, it's right, it's just about 100. I think this is a little inaccurate right now. So it's just about 100 degrees. So we're a little bit high on the head pressure, but I think what's going on, and I think that compressor's not pumping correctly. I think that that uh, internal bypass is partially leaking by, is my theory here. Because I can't, my sight glass all of a sudden, it's, it's just barely flashing, but it's flashing. And I checked the temperature drop across my dryer, it's not plugged up. We're gonna try to pump it down at the temperature controller and see if it, uh, if it goes off on bypass. I'm gonna try to get through the weekend because it's Friday afternoon. And I really don't wanna have to change this compressor tonight. So if I can get through the weekend, that'd be great, but we'll see. All right, so we tried to pump it down at the temperature controller, so just to satisfy the temp control. And that sound is the inside of the compressor bypassing. You can see, so it's running. It's still got a cold suction line. It still has a hot discharge line but it's just internally bypassing and you can hear it. And what it does is when it hits about 410 PSI, that's when it does that. So there's a couple things I could do. I might be able to throw a mister on here to keep the head pressure down for the weekend. Um, inevitably, we have to change the compressor. It's just whether or not I want to change it right now. So if I can keep the head pressure down, we can probably get away without having to change it. All right, so I've got it operating, but it's literally, I don't even know if I'm gonna make it. I'm probably gonna have to change it tomorrow, Saturday morning, maybe tonight, we'll see. Um, the compressor's about two hours away from me. Nobody local has it, so I'm gonna go pick it up. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna leave the mister on there. It's running, the box is actually down to temp right now, but it's just going bad, so. So I did not get my wish and I am changing this compressor. It's currently about six something on Friday night, so. Um, I just got the Rotolock adapters brazed or soldered on or brazed on. Use 56% uh, silver solder. I'm just cleaning up my welds now. Everything's nice and clean. I like to sand them when I'm done for whatever reason. My OCD likes me looking pretty. So, but yeah, that's where we're at. All right, I really can't film too much because I'm trying to do the work and it's late at night, but um, I ended up having, uh, they didn't have an inch and an eighth Rotolock, so I got a seven eighths. I got a bushing to inch and an eighth. It'll be fine. This valve, we tried to use the existing valve, but it broke when we were trying to take it off. We're gonna go ahead and use the existing discharge valve. This uh, 
fan cycle control broke off no big deal i'm not worried about that so we'll fix that and uh, yeah we're just trying to get it up and running we got the dryer cut out so a little bit out of time it's getting dark outside but we're getting closer got the pressure control installed the compressor wired up we still got to check phase rotation we're waiting i'm going to get my swage so we can finish the dryer everything's brazed in we got to pull a vacuum and then hopefully uh be good after that we'll see seems like it took forever but we got the vacuum pump running i just closed the gas ballast last i checked it was at about 1500 microns we're just letting it run i have like i'm 99 sure this thing has other leaks in it so i'm not confident that it's going to pull a great vacuum but we'll pull it as low as we can and then uh see how it holds a system this big i i wouldn't be the least bit surprised if we got leaks but like i said we'll see we are getting there it's at 917 so we made it under a thousand that's a plus so we're almost there put our dryer mounted it's not everything it's not as straight as i'd like it to be but you can only do so much when it's it's probably eight or nine o'clock at night now It is times like these that I do appreciate these big vacuum hoses. <laughs> they really do make it go a lot faster and a lot smoother, especially when you're under pressure. But So we've still got to power this guy on, charge it up, and then uh, we gotta make sure the phase rotation's correct because this is a three-phase scroll, so. Currently charging it right now. It held a pretty good vacuum. It pulled down to about 600 microns. That's about all I was gonna wait for. It held actually, um, but I can't wait any longer. We're gonna get this guy going. So um, just went ahead and opened it up um, and we're just charging as much liquid as we can into the receiver. We're at six pounds. The total charge on this guy is 25.2 pounds. So we're gonna go ahead and weigh in the factory charge. Uh, they calculated that to be the right amount for the head pressure control valve with the line set length and everything So it's kind of nice on some of these refrigeration systems when they have that calculation for you But if you ever do go through the process of figuring out the calculation It's always good to write it down for the next guy So that way, you know when it comes to something like this, they got what they need and they can just charge it up and Hopefully everything will be good So I couldn't really get it on film, but I started it up and it wasn't uh, sounding right It was way under amps. It was running five amps and the compressor was making a funny sound so that meant that the phase rotation was incorrect so i switched two leads and now we're much better and we're pumping got a cold suction line coming back we're right at um amps right now so we're gonna i, I kind of throttled the suction to kind of drop the amps down a little bit just so we don't overload it we're gonna get this guy charged up so it's gonna take a little bit all right, we're about 13 amps. I think the run load is like 14. So we're doing good on that. Pressures are looking good. Um, I haven't been downstairs, but I imagine it's probably about 40, 38 degrees, somewhere in there. So that's yeah, yeah, a little to be expected because we're probably flooding a little bit. Nice cold suction line coming back. Sight glass is clear. We put the factory charge back in so the sight glass cleared at 18 pounds and then uh, we filled it up to uh, what did I do we went up to 25 so but yeah we're good we're gonna uh, make sure it comes down in temp I'm gonna shut the system off shut everything off and do a leak check real quick and then uh, we're gonna come back and follow up probably Monday or Tuesday make sure all is well Saturday morning I came back to the scene of the crime I just wanted to kind of I don't know I, I was having a hard time sleeping thinking I did something wrong or forgot to do something so I just came back out here box is down to temp uh, it was actually satisfied when I got here watch it just turn on right now I'm not gonna put my gauges on today but we're running a clear sight glass everything looks good I mean there's a few things you know drive me nuts like the bracket for this pressure control is bent so it's not straight the dryer is not 100% straight, so it's kind of crooked a little bit, but this is just my stupid OCD. Um, it's stuff that can just let it go. It's not a big deal. But yeah, we're gonna uh, still be coming back because I gotta get a crankcase heater for this guy. The old one I couldn't get off. It was a pain in the butt. And then also uh, this uh, fan cycle control broke off. So I'm gonna get a new fan cycle control. Yeah, and other than that, that's pretty much it. It's working, customer's happy. So I'm gonna go home and enjoy my Saturday and uh, follow up with those other parts later. Wow, that one really turned into a disaster. 
um, what was a simple call, well, what was kind of a simple call as a uh, beer walk-in that was icing up. And then uh, uh, initially, I just found that the power switch was off. But then the further I dug, the more I unraveled, found that there was electrical problems. Things were never hooked up from the very, very beginning from day one. And that restaurant's been there since 2004, I think. Um, what a mess. Ended up correcting that. Uh, like I mentioned in the video, I ended up changing the system over to an air defrost because there was really no need for electric defrost. Again, we still have to monitor the system to make sure that my changes as far as the defrost strategy goes don't create a problem, but I really don't think that they are. And like I said, you know, that coil temp never gets below 20 degrees really. So there's no point in really having electric defrost except for uh, maybe being able to defrost really quickly. But at the same time, they didn't have uh, the proper limit switches hooked up inside that unit. So it was just kind of a disaster. And then found that the system was running the pressures too low, found that we had power heads that were going bad. And then on top of that, they were pressure limiting power heads, which again is another problem because that's not a low temp system. So I corrected that and then that just unraveled the problem with the compressor. So like I said, kind of in the video, I have a feeling that the compressor had been going bad for a while. But because it had the pressure limiting power heads, it was reducing the suction pressure, therefore reducing the load on the compressor. So um, I think that the, the pressure limiting power heads, changing those over to a medium temp, which got it working properly, but then it overloaded the compressor. And then on top of that, we had a dirty condenser. It was just like one thing after another. I think that that day altogether, I started at 7 a.m. and I walked in the door at 11 p.m. And that seems excessive amount of time, but when you think about what I did, I unraveled a bunch of things there. And then you have to throw into the fact that I had to go get a compressor that I was two hours in traffic. Uh, actually, no, I, I had three hours in travel time, an hour to go pick it up, and then two, actually three and a half hours, about two and a half hours coming back. Um, I did have another technician come out and help me um, when I was installing the compressor, I had an apprentice with me during the day, but you know, he was just kind of helping me held the camera. And then we were just kind of, I was explaining what I was doing. And then, uh, when I went to go change the compressor, I had another technician come out and go ahead and uh, help me out by recovering all the gas. So when I got back with the, the new compressor, uh, he had already recovered all the gas out of the system and, uh, had already started unbolting the compressor. And then that was kind of where the video started again. Um, but yeah, um, and then, you know, I, I got it all finished up and got it running. Little things happen. Crankcase regular or crankcase heater went bad or I couldn't get it off. The, the fan cycle switch broke, you know, that's just normal stuff. So I'll take care of that later. But then, um, you know, I came home, got home about 11 o'clock, I think something like that. And immediately started to second guess myself and doubt myself. Um, and, and I slept, but I didn't sleep really well because I kept thinking, did I, did I check the temperature controller? Did I make sure that we didn't leave it set wrong? Did I do this? Did I do that? You know, I was worried that there was going to be a leak. So, uh, six 30 in the morning, I was pretty much awake, kind of tossing and turning and I just, I couldn't deal with it. So I jumped up, got dressed and went back out to the job site. It's about half hour from my house just because I just needed to know. I didn't want it to be a service call and I wanted the customer to be taken care of. Um, that's the kind of stuff that drives me nuts. I, I have many sleepless nights thinking, did I turn that on? Did I check this out? Do I wish that on other people? Yes and no, because that does make you a technician that, that cares about what you're doing. But it also sucks because you lose sleep over things like that. And sometimes you lose sleep over nothing like last night. I was just worried that I did something wrong we went out there and everything was fine. But, you know, I do think that that's a good value because that that means that I care, you know, and that I honestly do. Um, it wasn't just I mean, it is about making money. We're in business to make money, but it's also about delivering on what I promise and making sure that I can do my job properly and take care of the customer and that the customer is happy. Yes, this is going to cost the customer a lot of money. We had overtime labor, all kinds of stuff, right? It's going to be a very, very big bill, but it's taken care of. Do you think that the previous company could have done this job properly? Do you think it would have worked out? Do you think they would have lost beer sales? You know that this customer didn't lose any single beer sales. I had that system running and operating. And I'm not trying to gloat and make myself look better. I'm just trying to say I care to the point that simple things like when uh, when I diagnosed the compressor was bad and when I went to go pick it up, I put the mister on there. So that way I dropped the head pressure so it ran the entire time I was gone. You know, and the customer was like, dude, we never lost product. We never had to stop beer sales because I was concerned about their sales. I want to make sure that they're happy. I want them to realize that I have their best interests in mind.
you know, and yes, it is about making money, but at the same time, it's about making sure that, that my reputation's good, that the customer's taken care of and that they get what they want from me. Okay. So it's very important. I think that that's something that we're lacking right now. I think that we're definitely lacking, uh, with a lot of people in the trade, um, that, that, you know, they just don't have that passion. They just don't have that, that want to make sure that things are a hundred percent, you know, they don't have that drive. Um, I'm not saying everybody's that way and I'm not trying to bash everybody in the industry, but I'm just saying, take a little bit of time and think about it. Be concerned about the customer, you know? Um, yes, the money's going to be there. You're going to make the money. There, there's a lot of things to be worried about in this trade, but it, you know, if you can just start with doing a good job delivering on what you promise, make sure that you do to the best of your abilities, the best of your company's abilities, you know, your, your reputation is going to make you succeed. And I'm not saying I'm the most successful person in the world. I'm not. We struggle as a business just like everybody else. But there's one thing that I don't have to worry about. I don't have to have a sleepless night because I rip someone off because I never do. In fact, I probably lose more money. Um, because I'm worried about, oh, does, that's, that bill seems excessive, so I shave hours off of it and different things like that. I constantly do that. So anyways, I'm going off on a rant now. Um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to watch these videos. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Send me an email, hvacrvideos at gmail.com, and uh, we will catch you guys on the next one, okay?